Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. I received a report from a witness who had experiences in Montana in the year 1979. She was 16 at the time. Her father grew wheat on some 600 acres. He owned the neighboring house and its land, which he rented for extra income. It was rented by a man who, with the assistance of his sons, operated a small company that hauled, scrapped, and sold old vehicles and farm equipment. His rent included the house and the use of some 20 acres of untillable land, so the rental was mutually beneficial for both landlord and tenant. The tenant wanted to remove some trees on the rental property, which the witness's father was fine with. The tenant was your stereotypical man who had worked too hard for too long, slightly bent forward from a life of carrying things that are too heavy for too long. He appeared older than he was. His face was worn, and the witness recalls that he seemed to be on the verge of falling asleep at any moment, evidenced by his constant companionship of Mountain Dew and cigarettes, as he'd drive to and from the main road. The tenant was a nice enough man, from our witness's limited interaction with him. He had put up two chicken coops, and often brought eggs with his rent, which was a nice gesture. It was a Sunday evening, and the witness was on the porch with her mother, her mother was clucking about the tenant sawing away at trees on a Sunday evening. It didn't bother the witness. The rental house, two dozen vehicles and chicken coops, blocked the sight and sound of the tree line itself, and you could barely even hear it from inside. A Sunday evening, of all times, said the witness's mother, when the shrill whine suddenly stopped. After a mere matter of seconds, mother and daughter heard four gunshots in rapid succession. This was not the pop of a pistol. This was the crack of a rifle. And they sounded frantic. Neither of the girls recalled hearing gunfire from the property before. They heard their tenant shout something. And they had never heard a voice from the property either. It was too far from earshot normally. Meaning the tenant shouted louder than usual. The witness thinks she heard, That's it, that's him, or get him. The songs of twilight went quiet as the birds ceased their songs. Mother shepherded daughter inside, where they continued their vigil from the kitchen window. The witness's father came down the farmhouse stairs, thunderous to honed ears. He said that maybe they had a bear. The witness's father had seen black bear in the area before, but never on the property directly, and he actually never saw a grizzly bear at all as less than 2% of the grizzly population remained in the continental U.S. by 1970, since the days of Lewis and Clark. But most of those were in fact in Montana, so a grizzly bear wouldn't have been unheard of. And grizzly are certainly more than capable of compelling a person to shoot first and ask questions later. The night ended quietly. In the coming days, lights went up near the rental house, first on the siding of the house itself, and then with freestanding lights on the perimeter of the tree line. This accompanied the appearance of a large dog on a long chain. This amounted to a faint glow from the rental at night, but nothing more. At the end of the month, one of the tenant's pickup trucks pulled into the witness's long driveway. It was one of the tenant's sons who helped run the business. The young man exited the truck bearing an envelope with a check and half a dozen eggs. He probably wanted to leave them on his landlord's porch, with a clean getaway. But the witness's parents weren't having it. They corralled him inside, with the offering of coffee. I guess our witness had something of a crush on this fellow, as she spied upon his daily labors. So she did what any self-respecting adolescent primate would do. She retreated out of sight, to listen to the interaction from concealment. She knew her father wasn't particularly happy with whatever the tenant was doing that apparently involved enhanced security measures, and she worried about his short fuse. Her parents asked the young man if he had any plans for college. He said no, not really. They asked if the business was going well. He said yes it is. Too good. Too much work. Then he asked if they had a bear come around. 
He couldn't help but notice the lights and the dog and gunfire from the property the other day. The young man said, Well, um, yeah. After a pause, her father continued, Did you get him? Um, yeah, yes. After some uncomfortable silence, she heard chair on floor. The young man, presumably on his own accord, got up to leave. While parting, he said, We sold the chickens. They're being picked up tomorrow. Just so you know. She heard them make their way out the front door. She advanced. Stay safe out there, said her dad. Her mom said, God bless. He hadn't touched his coffee. A little after two weeks, our witness lay awake in bed. Midnight had passed, her window was wide open, and her white drapes fluttered ghostly in the bright night's breeze. She heard the unmistakable growl of a big dog that quickly rose to a back-of-the-throat bark and ended in a sharp, shrill whine. Then guns went off. She heard at least six or seven shots in the night. From two different guns, she said, quote, one that popped and one that thumped. Barely audible, she heard men speaking, but it was far too quiet to make out. The lights in the house went off, and more lights went on outside, and it stayed that way until morning. Her room faced the area directly, and she wasn't sure if the commotion was loud enough to wake her father, a serial snorer, and mother, who had adapted to the snoring. But he must have heard it, because he gave explicit instructions that no one is to stray from the house porch or pavement, until further notice. However, that afternoon, she had about a two-hour window that both her parents would be away. Cutting through the wheat, she guessed it would take five minutes. It probably took ten minutes, but it felt like an hour. Though she was taller than the wheat, and could maintain a line of sight all the way to her bedroom window, the slopes, patterns, and sun disoriented her. There was a feeling of dread, unlike any she had experienced before. The slopes made it impossible to tell where she was headed, and her trail neatly folded shut behind her. Every insect that abandoned its stalk, and bird that fled its hiding, seemed to be some form of beast, even if only for a moment. She doesn't assert that this is anything more than the youthful mind at work, but dread seems to be a reoccurring piece of this puzzle, so I think it's worth a mention. She came out against the tree line not far from where she expected, on the borderland between the trees and wheat. At this point, she was more concerned with getting home than the mystery at hand, but she was not entering that field again. She was entirely uneased with the woods to her right, half expecting a great arm to pluck her like a grape. She envisioned shadows darting in her periphery, but of course, that was just her imagination, she said. She came upon the rental. The first oddity she noticed was the sheer amount of lights. From her house, they cast a faint glow against the bright Montana sky. But up close, she wouldn't have imagined it was produced by so many lights. They were not illuminating the car lot, rather only the perimeter of the woods, with a web of less than legit extension cords and duct tape. It literally created a perimeter of light, indicative of an intruder that refuses to surrender its concealment, no doubt well aware of the consequences. The back door of the house was elevated on a porch, with columns connecting to the overhanging roof. She noticed cordage pinned to the columns. It was electric fence. It made a ticking noise where a leaf on a spider web tapped. Even the entryway above the first stair was laced off with wire. It appeared as though the tenants could only exit or enter the house through the front door, at least without a considerable amount of work. There was a bench and a rocking chair on the porch. Rifles lay beside them, and a clutter of ashtrays and magazines to keep the nightly sentinel company. The windows were barred. She ran all the way home. Later on in the evening, her dad returned, but he missed the drive and continued down the road to the rental. He stayed there late into the night. Her father wasn't upset as she feared he may be. He said that the tenant had an aggressive bear, and no one was to go near the tree lines or out alone at night. He said that the tenants are moving because they require more space in a less out-of-the-way location, 
and the bear problem was just one of the factors. The house was not re-rented. Our witness ended up going to college in the Southwest, where she would acquire a PhD in psychology, which appears to be legitimate, as far as my limited snooping can tell. Due to declining health, her parents followed ten years after her. The witness's father died in 2004, once the cancer reached his bone. But before his passing, he had discussed his conversation with the tenant at length with his daughter. The day he went over to the rental property, he didn't really know what to expect, but he was getting to the bottom of it one way or the other. The tenant was direct, genuine, and sincere. He apologized for not having a beer to offer, as he had quit drinking years ago and kept a clean house now. The tenant didn't beat around the bush, nor did he mince words. He informed his landlord that they had, quote, ape men coming around. The tenant said that his first awareness of the, quote, ape men started with the house being pelted with rocks, most of them quite small, some larger. He had no idea what was doing it. One night, during the nocturnal pelting, he came onto the porch, 12 gauge in hand. He said something along the lines of, Come out where I can see you, or I start shooting. The rock stopped, and he was answered with a, quote, slow panting and deep, bubbling growl. He said it was unlike anything he had ever heard. He retreated inside, convinced that no human was out there. Stunned, he stood by the kitchen sink, peering out the windows. But he saw nothing. The pelting resumed. It is worth noting that the tenant knew there were not enough rocks laying around the forest floor for the constant tap and knock of stone that he heard, and he was under the impression that they must have, quote, brought a basket of them. Three of his four adult sons refused to stay in the house overnight. That's when they went about setting up the first wave of lights, an effort to identify the rock throwers. But the creatures never entered the light, and were presumably driven out of throwing range of the house. One evening, when the tenant and one of his sons were using the chainsaw, they saw one too close for comfort. The tenant dropped the saw and fired off a few shots, but it already had foliage behind it by the time the trigger was pulled. It had merely darted into the line of sight, just long enough to be seen. The only details that made it from the tenant to the father to the daughter to me are that it was approximately eight feet tall and puffed its chest out like a peacock. Unfortunately, no information on facial features or posture or even its color ended up being transmitted. I guess he thought Ape Man was descriptive enough. He took it very personally that none of his bullets caught the creature. He said, quote, If I was 15 years younger, it would have had a real bad day. The only apparent motive for this intrusion was if to say, I'm big. I can get close to you without you knowing. Be careful. And they were. It was only after this daylight sighting that the tenant confirmed the identity of the creatures. Amazingly, he said he first heard of them when he was in Vietnam, as evidenced by the POW MIA hat that never left his head. He said that, quote, ape men were an occasional topic of the soldiers in the Southeast Asian jungles. He said that they were described as only a head higher than the locals, so, quote, not bigger than a white man. They're bigger over here. Strange to hear of something a world away and then see it in your backyard. Only a few days later, in broad daylight, while the house was vacant, something battered down the door, porch and entryway. It did not appear to go inside, but the place smelled like death. That's when the electrified fence went up and the nailed boards went down. They had actually nailed the boards to the porch, aware that the creature could simply toss them aside. That's when they got the dog, too, but the dog didn't last. An hour after midnight, the tenant was on the porch, smoking in his electrified cage, when the dog's bark roused his attention. Lit up in the lights, he saw a bounding creature. He fired at it, but the rifle jammed, and he used the sidearm, more hopeful to intimidate it than hit it at that point. 
He said it had the dog pressed against its chest as it ran off with it. It only took a moment for the cord from which the dog was tethered to go taut. The chain didn't give, nor did the axle of the tractor to which it was tied. But the dog did. It, quote, made a mess. Apparently, to say broken neck would have been something of an understatement. Of course, the witness's father went to the property less than 24 hours after this nighttime intrusion. The tenant had not yet buried the dog, and it lay beneath a tarp. The two men dug a grave together. The witness's father said, without going into further detail, that the condition of the dog was gruesomely consistent with what the tenant claimed to see. The tenant and all's junk were gone within three months' time. The property, quite intentionally, went unrented and unused, less than a mile from the main house. If they wanted it so bad, they could just have it, her father said. They lived on the property for over a decade with no further incident. I brought up post-traumatic stress disorder, as the tenant was in Vietnam. She said something along the lines of, PTSD certainly may manifest in episodes of delusional psychosis, but delusions associated with post-traumatic stress tend to be brief and volatile, not extended scenarios, and though numerous mental conditions may initiate drawn-out psychotic misbeliefs and compulsive behaviors, it is highly unlikely that he would have been able to engage his sons in the fantasy, much less convince an outsider of its validity. Which sounds good to me. Unfortunately, the tenant did not give much of a physical description to his landlord. But three characteristics were mentioned. It was eight feet tall, had a chest puffed out like a peacock, and emitted, quote, slow panting and deep bubbling growls. As far as the prominent chest display is concerned, it is likely a feature of the creature's anatomy as well as a product of the creature's behavior. Displaying the chest is a textbook primate demonstration of dominance and strength, humans perhaps being the best example. Throughout history, many dominant leaders with the strongman persona exemplified their chest, often accompanied with hands clasped behind the back, consequently flaring the pectorals. It is a physical and psychologically subversive suggestion of power, threat, and dominance. Just as bowing is a physical and psychological display of submission and respect, hiding the chest and exposing the neck and face. So yes, I'm sure its chest was, quote, puffed out like a peacock. And as for the, quote, slow panting and deep bubbling growls, well, I've heard that before. From Gorilla. Here is an audio of a female western lowland gorilla. The smallest subspecies of gorilla. So the specimen that made these vocalizations was likely between 150 and 200 pounds. Imagine a creature three to four times larger than this, with perhaps a more murderous intention. She said she knows it's all very strange, but I don't think it sounds all that strange. Seeing as such reports are nearly as old as recorded history in North America, and apparently they persist, which is curious. Anyhow, like and subscribe, and as always, Thanks an awful lot for listening.